Uh, I am so grateful to get to share with you this morning. Uh, I love you and appreciate um, getting to reflect your wisdom back to you wherever you are. And I get to continue a series this week and next week called Everyday Spirituality. And today's topic is Everyday Ritual. Everyday spirituality begins as soon as you wake up in the morning. Everyday spirituality begins as soon as you wake up in the morning. And my first inclination when I get up is to, is to sit. Sometimes my four-year-old daughter has other plans for me. Sometimes we got to take a shower or put on the coffee. But as soon as I can, I sit. And spiritual practice in the morning time is, is the best for me because I'm, uh, I've just been in a non-waking state. And it's at this time that I feel I am most vulnerable to the transcendent. I'm most vulnerable to the transcendent. And it's that opportunity that I can be aware and conscious, not of the life that I'm living, but of the life that's living me. And it doesn't necessarily matter where I sit. It's great if you have a place you can go to every day. What's important to me is the tools that I bring there. That for me is a journal and a pen, a spiritual practice book, and a hot cup of black coffee. (laughs) And that journal comes in handy when that life that I think I'm leading uh, is calling me. Don't forget about this. Did you forget to do that yesterday? Remember, you've got this going on today. So I take a moment, I write it down, and I get back to that life that's living me. And I grab that cup of hot black coffee. Sorry, ushers, I'm breaking the rules (laughs) this morning. And I like the coffee, not just because it's caffeinated, but it awakens my senses. It's warm in my hands. It's not sweet, but it's bitter. And it smells good. And it helps me do what meditation really is, which is appreciating the moment. Meditation is appreciating the moment. And at some point, my meditation moves from that cup of black coffee to the breath. And the breath symbolizes so much, but three things in particular. The first, life itself. The word spirit comes from the word breath. So breathe with me consciously. And that's the other thing that that it's doing. We're taking our, our waking conscious mind and we're combining it with our subjective mind. We're bringing our awareness to this part of our intelligence that breathes our breath and beats our heart without any conscious need for control. And so we're taking this duality of ourselves and we're making it one in that moment. The other thing the breath helps us to do is it has this external and internal function. And so it represents the harmonizing of our exterior and our inner reality. I don't know about you, but that is when I'm living fully, when the outside and the inside are in harmony. So I just keep breathing. And after some time, I move to my spiritual practice book. What do I mean by spiritual practice book? I mean that kind of book that you can just turn to any page and there's something there just for you. That you, all you need is just a, a couple paragraphs. It's not the kind of book that's making a grand intellectual point that builds up or that has narrative spinning here or there. It's something that you can turn to anywhere and enjoy and take in. Uh, I've created a list coming on the, the screens of just some spiritual practice books that have made a big difference in my life. I've read all of these multiple times. Uh, Another favorite of mine I will share from today, it's the Tao Te Ching, and uh, my favorite version is the translation by the great science fiction novelist, Ursula Le Guin. And here's a passage for our spiritual practice this morning. 
mysteries of power. Who knows doesn't talk. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Who talks doesn't know. Closing the openings, shutting doors. Blunting edge, loosing bond, dimming light. Be one with the dust of the way, so you come to the deep sameness. Then you can't be controlled by love or by rejection. You can't be controlled by profit or by loss. You can't be controlled by praise or by humiliation. Then you have honor under heaven. And I love spiritual practice, folks. It's not always what the author says that attracts me, but it's how they think. And I love opening my mind to the mind of others and just experiencing that inspiration and taking it for a moment into contemplation. And I know um, if, I, if I've missed what I've read, um, I feel stuck. So I'll go back and I'll read it again and I'll just uh, settle into that. It's then that I move into my morning prayer practice. For me, prayer was best defined by Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said that prayer is the contemplation of the facts of life from the highest point of view. Prayer is the contemplation of the facts of life from the highest point of view. That's all that it need be. I bring my intention and open my heart to God, to love, to healing, to peace, to joy, to what is really most sacred and what matters. And then I apply it to people who've asked me for prayer. I think of God and I think of them. I think of healing and then I think of them. Then I pray daily for the people in my family that I love and care for the most. I think of joy and then I apply it to them. I think of love and I apply it to them. In my own practice, I I guess I'll call it freestyle. I just like to open my heart and my mind to anyone that may come to mind or heart. And as long as I'm not praying for things that they don't want to happen, I can surround them with light and love. Who may I be keeping out of my heart this morning? Who have I possibly forgotten about? Maybe there's a stranger that I don't even know. And in this space, I'm contemplating their good in light of a great God, of a great spirit, of a great love. And I pray for myself as well. I have a little practice. I call it being there before it happens. It's allowing my consciousness to precede me in a meeting or a talk or an activity uh, to be there even before I've entered the room. I may have an affirmation or something that I'm nurturing and cultivating. And I love this spiritual practice time. It's then that I grab that journal and that pen and I write. Might be a talk for Mile High Church. Might be something for a book. If I don't have a lot of time, it might just be, this is what I seek to be grateful for today. And I love these practices so much that in my experience, not only is my morning spiritual practice the most important thing I do each day, but I like to say in some ways it's the only thing I do that day. Because even though the ritual of meditation ends, its essence stays throughout my day. Even though the ritual of prayer ends, it continues to show up as a knowingness and prayerfulness in my activity so that every choice that I make, every response that I have is somewhat based upon that consciousness that I was able to cultivate and nurture right there and right then. You know, there's lots of terms for spirituality. And I have a couple I want to really tune in on today. The first is intentionality. Spirituality is intentionality. It's about living your life with intention. But it's not just the kind of intention about what you want to have happen or see take place. It's the intentionality that is aware that you live in creative mind. You live in a creative intelligence. And what you think and how you feel and what you dream and what you envision and what you choose, they matter. It all matters. 
in this creative field. And I'm not a believer that it creates everything that happens to you, but it sure does co-create a lot. Because that's what we teach in Science of Mind, that we are always co-creating with a greater intelligence, with a higher power. Our founder, Ernest Holmes, says, we often wonder about the relationship between the individual and the universal, the relationship of the creative power of our thought to the creative power of God. And the answer to this is that we are some part of the infinite spirit. I've said it before, but I'll say it again. There is nowhere in your life where you can't be intentional. And the more intention you bring, the more sacred and the more a part of your life you will feel. The more that life you're leading can be filled with that real, true life that's living you. Another term for spirituality that I think is quite important is timelessness. The spirit is timeless. And I know we like to say I'm a spiritual being having a human experience, and I love that. But another side of that, a way I like to put it, is there's part of me that lives in time, my body, and there's part of me that lives in the timeless, my soul. And so when I can intentionally make time for the timeless, I'm making room to experience who I am at a soul level. And all of a sudden, these hours and these passing of days are filled with the essence of what we would call eternity, timelessness. When I'm a human being, I can only see partially and often from a place of being separated from the world around me. When I'm coming from a place of soul, I can see as God sees. I can see and feel even the unseen, the harmony that comes forth in life. Now, when I'm talking about this idea of the timeless, it may sound a little esoteric, but for me, it's also incredibly practical. Just a few things practically that making time for the timeless offers us. The first is it helps us to stop and smell the roses, that most practical piece of rich advice. Anyone here busy? Right, that's, that's where we're living for time. We're living for a to-do list and my busy friends. And sometimes I catch myself saying, if I only had more time, I'd get more done. And when I hear myself or a friend say that, I think to myself, are you sure about that? Are you sure if you had more time that you wouldn't just have more to do? Because busy begets busy. Busy can only beget busy. But when we can embrace the fullness of the timelessness, we find out that what we're really looking for isn't more time, it's more space. It's breath. It's depth. It's the ability to enjoy my life in this moment while it's taking place so that I'm not experiencing life as it's wishing by, lost, not feeling myself. Making time for the timeless allows us to live in a meaning place instead of just in a marketplace. Because that's what the secular world is. It's a marketplace. It's all about transactions. But when we live our lives centered on meaning, it's about love. It's about connection. It's about dignity. It's about making our lives and other people's lives better. It's about making the connection. I don't want to live in a marketplace. I want to live in a meaning place. And lastly, Making time for the timeless gives us extra layers of awareness. If one wasn't enough, extra layers of awareness so that I can maintain a level of mindfulness that's aware of my thinking, that's aware of my feeling, that's aware of the words that I'm choosing to use and how I'm showing up in the world. It is a consciousness of wholeness that we can reach, that we can hold even in a broken experience. Even in the fracture, we can remember this wholeness. And there's no greater gift that this philosophy as a teaching has given me than to nurture that consciousness of wholeness that in every piece of my life, there's a semblance of anchoring me back to spirit, 
to love and to God. When we intentionally make time for the timeless, we are engaging in ritual. We are engaging in everyday rituals that takes our slogan for the series that to live a full life feeds your spirit. When we make that time, we're creating rituals that, that fills the sense of eternity and vitality and vibrancy into our experiences. We teach in our philosophy what we call the golden thread. This is the interfaith aspect of our teaching. We look at all the world's religions without fear, without trepidation, not to take us away from our faith, but to strengthen it. And we find, try to find the commonalities. And I would say the greatest commonality in all faiths is they all have rituals. They all have rituals. Mercia Iliad, great scholar, not only of the world's faiths, but of aborigine tribes and religiosity. And he theorized quite simply, but very profound, that all ritual is designed to do the same thing, to bring forth an experience of sacred time, to bring forth an experience of the timelessness, to call forth the time of creation when the heavens and earth were formed, but not in a past time, but in a primordial time that is right here and right now. And when we do this, we experience ourselves not as created, but creative beings. Not in a created world, but in a creative world. In this creative intelligence. It doesn't matter if it's confession or communion, testimony or family home evening, meditation or prayer, honoring of the ancestors or a ceremonial dance. All of these call forth the sacred remembrance of sacred time that gives us the life that we're longing to live. Feeds the soul. Feed your spirit. Open your heart and your mind to the wonderful. The next aspect of rituals in day-to-day -day life for me, I'll, I'll call self-care rituals. Everyone here get ready in the morning. Maybe some of you at home, not yet. <laughs> it, it was hard for me to bring uh, consciousness to getting ready because I realized I had a whole different set of rituals going. They were shame rituals. Looking at myself in the mirror and not liking what I see. Experiencing my nakedness in the shower and feeling there was something unattractive or not good enough about me taking clothes out of the closet that I kind of curse as not fitting or being too old, brushing the teeth and worrying about something in the day. The, these rituals, they have meaning and they create purpose. And it's a powerful thing when instead of rituals of shame or self-criticism, that we can bring a consciousness of sacredness and love and intentionality to how we care for ourselves putting good food in our body, blessing our body, even if we're not happy with everything about it, loving ourselves, looking in the mirror. My daughter and I have a morning mirror affirmation. It goes like this. Hey, good looking. What you got cooking? Special meal just for me. It's cuter when she says it. <laughs> but care for yourselves. And the next level of that is when we can do things to care for our body that are in alignment with what we called last week all ramps. These things we can do that prepare us for sacred experience, solitude, art, nature. You could take some time in silence and eat your breakfast, prayerfully experiencing each bite, nourishing your body. You can go to the gym with a good podcast or some good music in mind. You can get out in nature and take that run or that walk or Bridget will ride her bicycle. Be in those things that inspire not just good health, but, but awe and reverence for the life that you live. 
Decker Keltner in his wonderful book, Awe, The New Science of Everyday Wonder and How It Can Transform Your Life, available in our bookstore. He and Virginia Stern develop what they call an awe walk. And they have two instructions for it. The first, tap into your childlike sense of wonder. Try to approach what you see with fresh eyes, imagining that you're seeing it for the first time. Take a moment to take in the vastness of things. For example, in looking at a panoramic view or up close at the detail of a leaf or flower. This is what William Blake meant when he said to see infinity in a grain of sand and experience eternity in an hour. See the bigness and the smallness. Sorry for my quote tangent. Two, go somewhere new. Each week, try to choose a new location. That said, some places never get old. The key is to recognize new features of the same old place. Morning rituals, self-care rituals, and I know for some that exercise portion might happen at the end of the day. For me, I like to get it all done before I enter the secular world. And we all have some experience of that where we're entering the marketplace, whether we're going to work or going to the grocery store to run errands, picking up the grandkids, whatever it may be, at some point we move into the world. But remember, we can take the essence of our practices with us. You can make sure you take time for what us kids call recess. I'm going to take some little bits to play. I'm going to take a, a moment to connect joyfully with a friend just to see how they're doing. I have a professional creed to practice genuine honesty and professional intimacy. All of us in the secular world, we can't help but be what Alan Watts would call being a genuine fake because we're playing roles all over. But I think that there are opportunities where we can be more transparent, where we can practice an intimacy with others without being weird about it, where we can seek to connect. We can place little altars in our day, screensavers, post a quote somewhere. My friend and one of our incredible prayer partners, Kristen Roberts, she, she has a practice that she calls taking care of her future self. What are you doing today to take care of your future self? It could be getting the coffee ready in the filter in the coffee maker. It could be ironing your clothes. It could be setting a reminder on your phone to remind you that you're life worthy and love worthy and doing the best you can. Not only does your future self appreciate it, but it looks back and says, hey, past self, you're not all that bad. So fill that, that secular day with these opportunities to remember and embrace and stay anchored in the sacred. The, the next aspect of rituals uh, I'll define as taking place under the heading of free time. I know it feels for many of us we have less and less of it, but I think everybody at the end of the secular day gets some sort of free time, whether it's many hours or a half an hour. This could look like playing a sport, watching TV, having a cup of tea or a glass of wine, listening to music, writing in your journal. These are all common activities. But they're one of two things for you. They're either about cultivating mindfulness or they're about escaping. I invite you to check in with yourself about that. Are the free time activities that I engage in increasing my sense of mindfulness or are they designed to help me escape, to numb out? Are they turning me on or are they turning me off? There's nothing wrong with unplugging from the secular world, but we should do so only to plug in to our higher self. And there's that part of ourselves, I'm so tired. I just want to turn off. I just need a break. And I honor and recognize that. But what I promise you is if you give yourself to that mindfulness, you may have to confront your thoughts and feelings, but ultimately it will energize you. It will give you that sense of life that you need to go into whatever the world looks like the next day. Where morning practices for me are all about prayer and meditation, the nighttime for me is all about forgiveness. It's all about release. It's all about reflection. 
It's all about letting go and doing the work and the rituals to prepare to move on, to recognize that tomorrow is a new day. And these rituals can be kind of like a healthy grieving, listening to that music, writing in your journal without judgment, having a good conversation about life, not to rile ourselves up about this life that we're leading that we think is so important, but to remember that life that's living us to reconnect with it and recognize that by doing that work, it provides the grace and the healing and that glue that helps bring together those fractures so that we can live whole and thriving once again. The last ritual we might call the going to bed ritual. We all have to go to sleep, and this is also a self-care ritual. So I invite you to consider, is my bed a boardroom or is it a cathedral? When I'm getting ready for bed, am I cursing myself or am I loving and caring for myself? When I put that head down on the pillow, am I doing more work? Am I questioning myself and cultivating a sense of worry and anxiety and regret or am I letting go? and letting God love me. What is going to bed and going to sleep but releasing control and allowing that subjective life, that inner life, to take care of you? I said that everyday spirituality begins as soon as you wake up in the morning, but the truth is, is that it never ends. It's always ongoing. I love something that Carl Jung once said, it's a little weird, but cool says, what is significant in psychic life always lies below the horizon of consciousness. And when we speak of the spiritual problem of modern man, we are speaking of things that are barely visible, of the most intimate and fragile things that are barely visible, of flowers that open only in the night. In daylight, everything is clear and tangible, but the night lasts as long as the day. And we live in the nighttime also. Isn't that a wonderful thought? That we don't have to think forward what's being called for in our lives. We need to only allow ourselves to be planted in the soil of that divine life, of that divine willingness, of what we might call divine surrender. And to know that these seeds that have been planted by the divine in us can take care of themselves they can blossom and flower and we can experience either a recovery or a renewal or a brand new sense of who we really are and who we're meant to be. Those flowers that blossom only in the night. So just taking this into prayer, I invite you to join me if you choose. I invite any of our practitioner prayer partners who care to stand. And this morning I commit to everyday rituals that recognize my existence as a soul. And I know that the soul provides the reverence, the resonance, the connection, the sense of love and sense of self that I may sometimes feel lacking. And I know that it flowers and grows in my life a greater sense of healing, a greater sense of becoming, a greater sense of allowing the best of what is called for to be. I get out of the way and allow these rituals to produce the best life that I can possibly live, knowing that no matter what, they have helped me return to myself so that I can live in an authentic joy, no matter what the sorrow or challenge present may be bringing again into our hearts all of those who may be struggling, whether it be on the beautiful island of Maui or someone in our personal lives. Let us know that there is indeed grace. There's indeed love. There's indeed healing and forgiveness. There's indeed a coming back to life, even after the most difficult challenges in empathy and in grace 
we open our heart for the highest and best to come forward, building an altar there for the most divine things to flower and to blossom. And so it is. Amen.